Now, I will say, Becky told me she did not want me to preach shorter, so sorry. Thank you for that. All right, turn with me to Genesis chapter 39. We left off a couple weeks ago at the end of chapter 37 with Joseph being sold to a man named Potiphar. His brothers had, you know, thrown him into a pit and they were going to kill him, but they decided to sell him into slavery instead. And so uh, the Ishmaelites took him down to Egypt and he was sold to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar is a captain of the royal guard, basically, in Egypt. So chapter 38, which we're going to skip over, it discusses the unrighteous actions of another one of Jacob's sons, Judah. It talks about what Judah did. Um, There would be some value in looking into that, but we're going to jump over that to 39 for, for our purposes today. So we're starting in Genesis chapter 39. Let's pray as we do this. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, your word is righteous and it's holy and it's good. And Lord, I ask simply that you just take this word and have it do your will today. Lord, uh, let me be clear in speech for the good of your people and for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Genesis 39 starts off like this. It says, now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. An Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who brought him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master. So one thing we've already learned and will continue to learn about Joseph is that he is a righteous man. He goes about things the right way. Sometimes, actually most of the time, this made him an annoyance to his brothers. His brothers did not like Joseph because when they were doing something wrong, he would go straight to their dad and let him know. He would give an honest report. What you're going to find in these couple chapters and then on in Joseph's life is Joseph is an excellent manager. And and I'll prove that out here in these next few verses. But Joseph is a righteous man who is all about doing things the correct way and doing things God's way. And so that's why it says the Lord is with Joseph and he became a successful man. Uh, when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made him made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor in his master's sight and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. So I've mentioned before that godliness has value in all things, and I truly mean that. So if you do your job in a righteous manner, naturally you're going to be a very good employee whatever job that might be. If you do your job in a righteous way, that is going to make you a good employee. Will that always mean that your boss blesses you? No, but generally speaking, if you have a good boss and you are doing your job in a righteous manner, your boss is going to take good care of you, right? That that would make sense logically at least, okay? So Joseph was a good man who did things in a righteous way and his boss just kept promoting him. His boss took notice of that and kept promoting him. It got to the point, says, from that time, he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. The Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in his fields. He left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. So Joseph was so good at what he did because the Lord was with him, but he was so good at it that his master not only kept promoting him, but then he gave him complete autonomy. His master didn't even bother to check in on what Joseph was doing because Joseph was so trustworthy. He was so righteous. Likewise, godliness, I can tell you, so I haven't been in ministry for all that long, but at any job that I've been in since I've been a believer, because the Lord is my ultimate boss, He has changed my behavior so that I have become a really good employee anywhere that I've been. That's part of the sanctification process. Godliness has value in all things. God will change your heart and he will transform you and you will be amazing at your job because you you won't make excuses for yourself to be lazy or to, you know, slack off or to do something, take shortcuts because that's not righteous, right? Hopefully you guys have seen that in your life. And if not, I promise you it's available to you. If you grow in righteousness, you're going to be better at everything that you do because that, you know, God's going to be with you in that. So Joseph rose up the ranks in his master's household and his master completely trusted him and didn't even have to check Joseph's work because he was so good at what he did. The second part of verse six, however, mentions... A problem that comes in. It says, now Joseph was well-built and handsome. 
After some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, sleep with me. So one thing I want to make sure you understand as we read through all these different stories that happened, you know, over a few thousand years ago, mankind really hasn't changed a lot since then. There are television shows that glorify this sort of thing now. You guys ever heard of Desperate Housewives? Hey, I've never watched that one, but, but you get the premise where these, you know, these women, they try to seduce and have relations with their workers. Okay, this was going on in Egypt because it was a wealthy society and his wife, Potiphar's wife, they were, you know, he was captain of the guard. He was well off likely. So she likely got to sit around and do whatever she wanted, basically. Idle time isn't always very good for us, Amen. It's not great to have too much idle time. So she begins to pursue Joseph romantically. It says, but he refused. Look, he said to his master's wife, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in his house. And he has put all that he owns under my authority. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how could I do such a great evil and sin against God? So Joseph refuses because of two things. One, his earthly master, Potiphar, he knew that would be disrespectful to him, but even more importantly, it was sinful against God. And he was a righteous man and wanted to follow God and do things correctly in everything that he did. So he refuses. However, it says, although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her. She was persistent. She continued to pursue after Joseph. Let's pause there for a moment, and I want you to think of just how impossible of a situation this puts Joseph in. Just, just stop the story right there. Because he can't really report to Potiphar and say that, hey, Potiphar, your wife, she keeps hitting on me. That wouldn't be, you know, it probably wouldn't be well received, and it would start problems. Yet, he's a slave. He doesn't have a right to just go and find another job. You know, he is a captive slave there. So he's sort of in an impossible situation. He has to continue to do his job, even though this woman is unrighteously pursuing him all the time, and he can't really talk about it with anyone. It puts him in a very challenging position. And so, it gets worse. It says, now one day he went into the house to do his work, and none of the household servants were there. She grabbed him by his garment and said, sleep with me. But leaving his garment in her hand, he escaped and ran outside. She pursued him more aggressively. And he once again refuses and he follows something that we covered actually in our early service this morning. The advice that God gives us when it comes to sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18, it says, run from it, flee from it. Joseph literally ran outside. He was so concerned, he was so convinced that he needed to do the right thing that he hightailed it out of there and ran away. Naturally, this would make Potiphar's wife upset and humiliated, right? So it says, when she saw that he had left his garment with her and had run outside, she called the household servants. Look, she said to them, my husband brought a Hebrew man to make fools of us. He came to me so he could sleep with me, and I screamed as loud as I could. When he heard me screaming for help, he left his garment with me and ran outside. So Potiphar's wife twists the story around. For Potiphar's wife, it's all about she wants to be perceived as desirable. She wants to be perceived as attractive. So the story to her would sound much better if he was the one pursuing her and she was the noble one who refused him. And after all, she outranks him, so she is more likely to be believed than Joseph is. So she turns the story around so that she was the good person and that Joseph was the unrighteous one. She put Joseph's garment beside her until his master came home. Then she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave you brought to us came to make a fool of me. But when I screamed for help, he left his garment with me and ran outside. So she then passes along the story to Potiphar. It says, when his master heard the story, his wife told him, these are the things your slave did to me. He was furious and had him thrown into prison where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph was there in prison. Now understand Potiphar could have actually had Joseph killed for this pretty easily. Yet, why do you think he chose to throw him in prison instead? The most simple reason is because, you know, God was with Joseph. So, you know, 
God, this was all part of God's plan all along. But also, Joseph had proved himself by his works to be a trustworthy servant. Potiphar didn't even have to look into Joseph's work because he was so reliable and trustworthy. There's a good chance that Potiphar didn't trust his wife fully, but he could not let anything like this just slide. So he threw him into prison instead of just killing him outright. But what you'll find is the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority, and he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and the Lord made everything he did successful. This is a wonderful story. Because the wonderful thing about Joseph's story is seeing that he continued in righteousness no matter what his circumstances were, and God was still with him no matter what his circumstances were. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this story and have read the end of the story and know what's going to end up happening. But look at the story along the way. Joseph, he had dreams when he was a young child of what was going to happen, but he couldn't have known exactly what the end was going to be. He couldn't have seen exactly how it was going to play out. To Joseph, a lot of bad things were happening to him. His brothers betrayed him and sold him into slavery. Did that, did, you know, he very easily could have been a worthless servant. Ah, well, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. You know, my own brothers kicked me out and sold me into slavery. I don't even deserve to be here. And he could have just pouted and been a worthless servant. But no, he was the best possible slave he could have been. And God blessed him because of that. And then even when he was doing right, he gets thrown into prison because of a false accusation. He could have been, oh, just leave me alone and, you know, mind his own business. But no, he was right. He was the best prisoner he could have been. And even in the prison, he was so righteous and he was so trustworthy. The warden said, basically, here, you're going to do all the work and I'm just going to trust you and didn't have to watch him because that's how trustworthy and righteous of a man Joseph was. I told you last week, Joseph typifies Christ in a lot of ways. Because Christ, in a lot of ways, was dealt the same hand as Joseph. Christ was completely righteous. Jesus was completely righteous. And yet, he was arrested. When he was arrested, did he complain and say, oh, it's not fair? No. They they would accuse him and accuse him and accuse him, and he didn't even fight back. He just took it. He took the punishment. It's a... It's righteousness that's almost hard to believe, but I promise you it's true. And this is how Joseph was acting. Even in the midst of his difficult situation, he continued to walk in righteousness. There's a very easy and simple application for us in this. Sometimes life deals us a rough hand, right? Plain and simple. We all have problems that we face from time to time. Our problems and our circumstances do not have to determine our attitude and how we respond to them. Joseph was terribly mistreated and he didn't deserve any of the things that got thrown to him here. But he continued to walk righteously and ultimately this is all part of God's plan. Right now, if we just stop the story there, that would not look like God's plan, would it? This guy, he only did things the right way and it just kept going wrong for him. It just kept going poorly for him. But, once again, you've already read the rest of the story. You already know what's going to happen. We'll continue through it. But understand that we don't have control over the circumstances in our life all the time. But we do have control over our attitude. We do have control over how we respond to our circumstances. It is possible to be righteous in the midst of incredible difficulty. It is possible to still have integrity when the whole world is falling around you. And God will be with you if you do that. He doesn't promise you a life that's easy and and free of trouble. Quite the opposite. Oftentimes, believers have a little bit harder lives because we can't justify just taking the easy way out of stuff. God holds us accountable. But he will be with you in it. Let's continue on. Chapter 40 says, After this, the Egyptian king's cupbearer and baker offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with the two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. So we're connecting some dots a little bit. Where does Joseph end up? You guys already know. 
Joseph ends up second in command to Pharaoh. Like I said, you've already read ahead in the story. But how does he get there? Well, it started with he had to be put in prison. Or else how was he going to meet Pharaoh? So then Pharaoh's servants, they offend him, and so Pharaoh throws them in prison. And the captain of the guard assigned Joseph to them, and he became their personal attendant. And they were in custody for some time. So then because of Joseph's righteousness and his faithfulness, these two royal prisoners are under Joseph's care. Goes further. The Egyptian kings cupbearer and baker who were confined in the prison each had a dream. Both had a dream on the same night and each dream had its own meaning. Well, when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? Why do you think Joseph asked that? Because he cared. He was a compassionate person. His character qualities that are given to him by God because he's staying true to God show up in every single thing he does. So he, he simply inquires because he sees some people under his care who look really distraught. We had dreams, they said to him, but there's no one to interpret them. Let's pause there. The Egyptians were a pagan society. They had different fortune tellers and mystics. Now, if you had a dream and you were out in common society, you could go pay someone basically to tell you what your dream meant. Okay? But they didn't have access to that because they were in prison. So we, there's no one to interpret them. But then Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Who else does that sound like in the Bible? But a guy by the name of Daniel. You've heard of Daniel? Same thing happened. There were some dreams, and this time there were the, you know, astrologists and the fortune tellers, and King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, they couldn't tell him what the dream was, so he said, you're not even qualified to interpret it if you can't even tell me what the dream was. He was going to have them all killed, but then Daniel said, well, don't interpretations belong to the Lord? Here, tell, you know, I'll tell you the dream and the interpretation, and there was blessing that came out of that. Same sort of thing. It's a pattern. So don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph. In my dream, there was a vine in front of me. On the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed them into Pharaoh's hand. So the cupbearer shares his dream with Joseph, says, this is the interpretation, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. You will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand the way you used to when you were his cupbearer. So Joseph interprets the dream, and the interpretation of this dream is good. But then he goes a little bit further. He says, but when all this goes well for you, remember that I was with you. Please show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should put me in this dungeon." So did Joseph know that what was done to him was wrong? Of course. Did he seek to, you know, get deliverance from that? Absolutely. But it did not consume his day-to-day life. If you're in a wrong situation, it is okay to try to get out of a bad situation, right? I mean, that makes sense. It is totally fine to try to get out of a bad situation. But don't let that control every single aspect of your life and your personality, Oftentimes we're in bad situations, but there are people, there are a lot of us actually, that can let a bad five minutes ruin your entire day, right? Joseph had a lot worse than a bad five minutes, but I'm just trying to apply this to our lives today. There are a lot of times that it seems like if someone has one little, it doesn't seem little, but if one thing goes wrong, all of a sudden, oh, it's just a terrible day. That doesn't have to be the case. You can continue to be righteous and keep a good attitude even as things go wrong. It's possible. You can do that with God's help. But he seeks to get freedom. Paul mentions in the New Testament, he says, if you're a slave, you know, basically be a good slave. But if you can get yourself freedom, do it. So absolutely get freedom. But so he petitions and he says, hey, once Pharaoh, because this dream's going to come true, once this happens, remember me. Now, and this, I feel bad for this guy in the story here. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was positive, he said to Joseph, so he's going to tell him his dream. Now that he saw that it's good news, he said, I also had a dream. Three baskets of white bread were on my head. 
In the top basket were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is the interpretation, Joseph replied. The three baskets are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from off you and hang you on a tree. Then the birds will eat the flesh from your body. This interpretation is not so fortunate. Oftentimes, when these people would go to the astrologers, the fortune tellers, they're only going there for good news, right? People do that today in society, right? You'll call the 1 800 psychic or whatever, and, you know, but you want them to tell you something good. You don't want them to give you bad news. So when he heard the first guy's interpretation that it was positive, he said, okay, well, I'll share my dream now. His interpretation wasn't so positive. However, how can you determine the validity of someone's interpretation, whether or not it comes true? On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he gave a feast for all his servants. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position as a cupbearer, but he placed the cup and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But Pharaoh hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had explained to them. So Joseph, both of his interpretations were absolutely spot on. But what did he tell the chief cupbearer to do? To remember him and say something to Pharaoh for him. It says, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. So this is where we're going to stop today. And what we've seen is that no matter what Joseph does, no matter how righteous he is, as of right now, life just gets tougher and tougher for him. He finally thought he had a road out, and then the cupbearer forgets. It would be easy. You know, it's easy to excuse the cupbearer's behavior. You know, you go from prison to all of a sudden you're back, and you're working for the king again. He's excited, and he just he simply forgets about Joseph's problems. But... As I've said, you've read the story before. You know where the story is headed. Understand that things had to happen this way for Joseph to get where he needed to be. While just about every turn looks like a bad one for him, they are all working together to place him exactly where he needs to be because Joseph had to be betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery to end up in Egypt, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't have any reason to go to Egypt. And when he was in Egypt, he had to end up in prison to get connected to Pharaoh. And as we're going to read next week, he had to connect, he had to interpret the dreams so that the cupbearer later on is going to remember when Pharaoh has a dream so that he can interpret that dream so that Pharaoh can promote him to a position of power so that whenever there's a famine in the land, Egypt will be prepared. And not only that, but his family who would starve to death in the famine if there was no one to relieve him would then come to him for salvation. The second part of the story is very positive and exciting. And I look forward to getting to that. I don't like just giving you bad news. But understand that he doesn't get to that second part without going through this first part. Guys, God works, the Bible says very clearly in the book of Romans that God works together all things for the good of those who love him. That does not just mean positive things. He does not just work together our good circumstances. He works together all things. The most difficult trial and challenge you might go through, if you just cling to God through it, he will find a way to work it for your good. I truly, truly believe that. It is often difficult and sometimes even impossible to see how God can take what you are going through and turn it into something good. But I'm here to tell you today that he does. This story, the second, what we get to next week is going to be perfect proof of that. Everything was going wrong for Joseph. But he continued in faith. He continued in righteousness. He continued doing good no matter what was coming his way. We can do the same. Before I was in Christ, even, you know, I was taught this through sports, through school. You know, they do character education in school. Doesn't always work all that well, you know, but they try their best because uh, we'd have all these different character words. But when we were told, told and taught about attitude, your attitude is the one thing that you truly do have control over. You have control over your attitude. Whatever happens to you, you get to choose how you respond to it, right? 
Now, are there influences trying to affect your attitude and control it? Absolutely. But in Christ, you truly do have control. It's all a matter of if you choose to use it or not. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you if you're a believer in Christ. So you have power over sin. Do you want to use it? I've mentioned this in Bible study a few times. Uh, But, you know, the idea is Christ freed us from sin, so we no longer have to sin. And pretty simple logic here. If you do not have to do something and you do not want to do something, you will not do something, right? If you do not have to do it and you do not want to do it, you won't do it. So in Christ, we no longer have to, but with us sometimes, there's still a want to, right? When things go wrong, I want to complain. I want to get frustrated. I want to lash out and I want to throw myself a pity party. I'm pretty good at it too. Ask Kelsey anytime I get sick. You guys ever heard of the man flu? I am terrible with the man flu. I mean, I can, Kelsey's been sick all week and she's just powering through it because that's the kind of person she is. She's just a champion. But if I get even the slightest bit sick, it's, whoa, it's me. Okay. That's a little bit of a joke of it, but it's serious. I mean, I do, I love to complain. But God has taught me over the years, okay, you complain, what does that do? Do you get feeling any better when you complain? No. Does the problem go away when you complain? No. Okay. So should you have that bad attitude about it? No. And then I learn because I don't have to give in to my sinful temptations anymore. And so God changes my heart so that I don't want to anymore, that I don't want to do the same things that I've done all my life that are bad habits. You can get victory over those. I'm digressing a little bit, but, but the application of this lesson, it is pretty simple. And it's already been said. Don't let your circumstances determine your attitude and your faith. God has seen the end of time and he's seen the beginning of time and everything in between. Nothing surprises him. He knows where you're at and he can keep you through whatever it is. And he can bring you to where he wants you to be. It takes time and it takes faith. Don't let your circumstances determine your attitude and your faith. Keep your faith where it belongs and God will deliver you. Does God always deliver you on this earth? No. Sometimes there are, there are trials we face on this earth that end with our earthly end. That's part of it. But I've become comforted over the past few years in understanding this. As a Christian, this world is not your home. As a Christian, even death does not separate you from God. In fact, death relieves you from this body that just this body's destructive. It's not, my body's no good for me a lot of times, right? I was told by a man named Paul, uh, not the apostle, I haven't spoke to him, but a guy that I went to church with, he always told me, he said, Cody, don't get old. It's no good for you. But the alternative seems a little bit worse at times. So, but, but understand our physical bodies, they, they struggle, they decay, they, they stop working like we want them to work. And it's easy to get frustrated about that. But even in that, God can be glorified. Simply trust God, follow God, have faith in God, and he will bring you to himself. Because that's the ultimate picture of salvation is being with him. Amen? Amen. We all hope, I think, I think we all hope that he comes back to us before we go to him. But either way, it's going to be glorious. All right? Uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you give us examples like this in the scripture. That you give us, there are examples of people doing things the wrong way and repenting of it so that we can understand that, you know, we can change. But Lord, there are examples like Joseph of of a man doing things the right way and seeing the results of that. Even though the immediate results don't look good, we, Lord, we know the big picture here. We've seen it. We've read the story. So dear God, thank you for that example For Lord, we struggle at times. We have many difficulties. But dear God, we know that you can bring bring us through them. Lord, if we just cling to you, help us to cling to you, teach us to do that, not to run astray, not to lash out, not to get a bad attitude, but to glorify you through the way that we live. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen.